hopefully you got to turn, tune into YouTube at some point this week and, and catch last week's message uh, from my home studio, also known as my office, and uh, hear the message from Luke chapter 14 that followed the passage that we had heard from the, the week before when we were actually together. We were not here, then we were here, then we were not here, and now we're back here. We're not going to continue this trend, I hope. Um, it's, it's a little bit um, hard to maintain focus on all that when you're doing like that, So, but we'll leave that up to the Lord. But anyway, we have been talking about um, the theme of our year, which is to intend to depend, to our, our focus and our desire, our prayer is that we are going to increase in dependence um, upon God this year, increase in our dependence upon Him. Uh, each one of us and us as a church collectively and together. And so we talked about that theme and that truth and that instruction from God's Word and how He has so much truth in His Word and so much encouragement from His Word and so many promises from His Word to lead us and to strengthen us to this truth of dependence upon Him. And then we talked about how one of the main things that we need for that dependence is humility. And so we talked about intend to depend and descend. In other words, descend from our lofty ideas about ourselves and our lofty um, trust in ourselves and instead have a, a focus of heart and mind that sees ourselves as not better than others, but sees them as better than ourselves as Scripture commands and treats them uh, in a way that follows that mentality. And then last week we talked about this um, in line with Jesus' parable that he teaches the people that he's sitting with at this dinner party. And we find that in Luke chapter 14, we're going to start back at verse 7 um, because that's really where we get the, um, the context of what's going on here. And so if you're in Luke chapter 14, I'm going to look at, chapter, at verse 7 with me. Starting there, we're going to read through verse 24. And this is what God's Word says. So he, he being Jesus, told a parable to those who were invited. Um, again, they're at this at this dinner party. He told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they how they chose the best places, saying to them, When you are invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be, be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, Give place to this man, and then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited... <clears throat> go and sit down in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes he may say to you friend go up higher then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you now here's the crux verse from, from this passage that we talked about uh, two weeks ago verse 11 for whoever exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted I asked my, I teach a class, teach two classes, as some of you may know, in the afternoons at, um, at Light of the World Academy. I teach uh, Bible classes there for um, fourth through twelfth graders. And I asked the younger class this week what it meant to be humbled. Um, and, you know, I was thinking about this verse and another one that they were, they were learning. And the boys from the younger class told me that being humbled being humble meant was like when you were had when you were pants in front of a crowd of people. And for those of you that don't know that, that means when somebody um, uh, voluntarily uh, removes your trousers um, to embarrass you in front of your friends and whoever else might be watching. That was their notion of being humble, and uh, I had to explain to them the difference between humiliation and humility. Um, but 
uh, but it was kind of funny that that was their idea. That, but they they were on the right track anyway. That having a lower a lowered opinion of yourself, or and so. Um, but God says here, the idea is this: whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And verse twelve says, then he also said to him, he invited him. When you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, remember this verse because we'll refer to it later on. For when you give a feast, invite the poor, the vain, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Now when one of those who sat at the table with, with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then he said to him, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many. This is Jesus speaking again, telling another parable. He said, A certain man gave a great supper and invited many. And his servant at supper at supper time, excuse me, and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, Come, for all things are now ready. But they all, with one accord, began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must go and see it. I ask you to have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to test them. I ask you to have me excused. Still another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot go. So that servant came and reported these things to his master. And we'll stop right there for a second. Just as a matter of review, Last week we talked about the fact that what Jesus is giving a picture of here is his preparation of the kingdom of God for the Jewish people and his invitation to them once he had cut all of the all of the promises and prophecies he had given to them about the coming of the Messiah who was going to come and, to, and be their deliverer to deliver them from their enemies and especially from their sin. And then when Jesus comes, he they they do what they they reject him. Um, in John chapter one, it says he came unto his own, and his own did not receive him. So he came unto the Jewish people, and many of them did not receive him, especially those who were who thought of themselves as very religious, very righteous. And so they give. They, he gives examples of excuses that they would give, and we talked about these last week, how all those were really lame and phony um, excuses that were really just man, man, manufactured to um, get, give them self-excuse as to why they couldn't uh, come, to justify to them why they didn't need to. And we do the same things sometimes with our own excuses about church and, and God and, and whatever else. God wants to deliver us from that. And so um, verse 21 goes on and tells us this. So that servant came and reported these things to his master, that the master of the house being, then the master of the house being very angry, said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and maimed and the lame and the blind. And the servant said, master, it is done as you commanded and it's still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. And the question that's raised by this passage and one that we need to ask ourselves and we need to ask you know, um, on behalf of others that we know is who is acceptable in God's sight? Who is acceptable in God's sight? And you might all have your ideas about that this morning and we all do whether we want or want to readily admit it or not but God spells it out for us here and it may not be what we who we think it would be we may not it may not be what or how we think it should be but it's how God perfectly has designed it to be and that's what we're going to see this morning we're going to see Three way or three, we're going to see three questions and answers to those questions about how to know who is acceptable in God's sight. Would you join me in prayer and ask God to help us uh, hear and answer these questions? Lord, we 
need your guidance on so many things, but nothing more importantly than who is acceptable in your sight. We want to be so, and we need to know how. And we want to help others to know how they can be so, so we want to know how, what to tell them. And we want to know how to see ourselves and to see others as you do. And so we ask this morning that you would help us to be able to ascend in the sense of being able to have your perspective on, on people and on your desire for them, your heart for them, your, your good news to them. Um, and we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that you're going to notice, and one of the things that I, one of the truths that I want you to uh, give ear to this morning, is that when we come to a place of understanding that we need to intend to depend and to sin, in other words, to humble ourselves, that opens up our hearts and lives to be able to do what I just prayed, and that is to ascend to a place of seeing things as God sees them. When we are proud, the opposite of humble, when we are self-centered and self-reliant and self-dependent, we typically see things the way we see them, the way we want to see them, the way we think we they ought to be. And while I know that it's a hard pill for us to swallow that this uh, that we could be wrong about those opinions and those perspectives, it's very very true. We are often wrong about our perspectives and our opinions and our views on ourselves and others. And Jesus points that out to us in this passage. Going back to Luke chapter 14, we're going to focus on um, somewhat of the same passage that we talked about last week, but mainly the second part of that. So let's read starting um, with verse 15. The first question we're going to ask is this. Who is acceptable in God's sight? Is it the righteous? Is it the righteous? And I want you to right now give what you think would be your probable answer to that question. Is it the righteous who are acceptable to God? The, the righteous, those who think they are righteous. And let's see what God says in Luke chapter 14. Now one of those who sat at the table with him heard these things. He said to him, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Now remember who Jesus is sitting with here. He's sitting with those who are Pharisees and religious religious leaders and religious elite. They are well convinced that they are righteous. They are so certain of it that they um, take it upon themselves to... Is, Jesus points out to them several times in the Gospels to display or to point out their righteousness to others who they who surround them, certainly those who they consider less righteous than themselves. And so they, when Jesus gives this the parable preceding this one about um, giving place to someone who. Uh, is higher than you um, if you take their take a high place assume a high place for yourself at a dinner table and instead instead um, instead of doing that taking a lower place so that you may be exalted uh, later on in, in other words leading us to that truth of he who exalts himself shall be humbled and he who humbles himself shall be exalted this fellow's response to that was not to say my goodness Lord Jesus I am a proud, I am not a humble man. Please teach me how to be humble so I can be like the person you just described who takes the humble place and therefore is exalted by the master. They're so self-assured about their religiosity and their righteousness that he says, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Let's bring it back to me for a second. And who's he talking about that's going to be that blessed person? Himself and those who are sitting there, assumably. Because they are the ones who assume that because of who they are and how well they follow the law, and not so much the law of the Old Testament, but their 
take on it and all the all the rules and things they have tied to it, they consider themselves to be acceptable in God's sight. And then Jesus goes on to tell another story because Jesus is awesome at recognizing when a crowd um, doesn't get the first story, he tells another one. It reminds me of a story, This you may have heard this before, because I probably told it to you before, um, but but um, the pastor at a new church, or new pastor at a, at an old church, I should say, preaches his first sermon when he gets there, and everybody's just like, wow, pastor, that was a great sermon, that was just awesome, can't wait to hear more, and second Sunday he comes in and preaches the same sermon, and they're like, okay, it was, it was good, second time around too, that's great, third Sunday does the same thing, fourth Sunday preaches the whole month of the same sermon. And so eventually he was kind of he was cornered by a bunch of folks and said, "Listen, uh, I really appreciate that sermon and, and everything, but uh, we were just wondering if you had another one. You might be uh, planning on preaching it sometime." And he said to them, "Well, I'll tell you what. Um, when you get this sermon and start and start doing what it says, that I'll move on to another one." Um, and I think that's what Jesus was hitting at here when he says. Um, I gave you one parable. Your response was, "Woohoo! Yeah, we are the righteous." And so I'm going to give you another parable and see if we can spell this thing out a little bit better. And so Jesus says to them in verse 16, "A certain man gave a great supper and invited many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to those who are invited, Come, for all things are now ready.'" We talked about last week how this was. Um, typical in that day and area and sometimes even now for something really formal there would be an invitation and then there would be a follow up invitation there would be the invitation to come and then there would be the announcement that the time had come and things were ready and that's what we're seeing here and then um, verse 18 it says but they all with one accord begin to make excuses and it talks about those excuses the first said I bought a piece of ground and I must go and see it I ask you to have me excused. And we talked about the, how that was a phony excuse because you don't buy land before you see it. Um, they certainly didn't back then. And we don't typically now. Verse 19 said, I have bought five yuka oxen and I'm going to test them. And I ask you to have me excused. Again, you don't buy livestock without seeing them or testing them first. Verse 20 says, still another said, I have, a, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. And probably the guy the servant said, oh, I, I, I understand that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, um, his wife wouldn't let him. Um, but even that wasn't um, excuse because there's nothing about being married that would have precluded him from uh, prohibited him from being um, at this dinner party. So the servant came and reported this to his master. And the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, "We'll just stop right there um, because." Um, well, actually, I'm, I'm, let's read all through. Go. Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor and the maimed, the lame and the blind. And the servant said, Master, it is done as you commanded, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, and then my house may be filled. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. None of those men who were invited shall taste my supper. Now listen. Remember that this passage started with this guy proclaiming, Blessed is he who shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. And then Jesus tells a story about who's actually going to eat bread in the kingdom of God. And finishes the story by saying, None of those who are invited shall taste my supper. And if the picture's not clear to you, and, and I, I, I hope it was clear to the fellows sitting there, the picture is this. Those of you sitting at this table who think that you are going to eat at the marriage supper of the Lamb, who, who think that they're going, they're going to eat bread in the kingdom of God, who think they're going to eat with the Master, Jesus Christ, forever and ever and ever in eternity, because of your rejection of true righteousness, the true source of righteousness, because of your dependence upon Him for your righteousness, your salvation, to, to, upon Him to make you right with God. 
none of you shall taste my supper. And that had to be a shocker to these folks. And so the question that we asked was, who is acceptable in God's sight? Is it the righteous? And my answer to that is probably not. Probably not. Now, we would assume that when we see people who are really acting religious or we see people who are really moral or we see people who don't, you know, do certain things that we think that um, are bad to do or they do certain things that we think are good to do, and then we call those people righteous. But what this is talking about is people who think of themselves as righteous because of who they are or what they do. And they depend upon their sense of self-righteousness to be what makes them acceptable in God's sight. And this is a danger that is was not just prevalent in the day of the Pharisees, in the um, in the time of Jesus, it's something that's prevalent even now, and it's prevalent oftentimes um, in the certainly in the world and even in God's church. And it's it's good for us to ask ourselves, uh, whose righteousness am I am I trusting? And do do you know uh, for certain that you have trusted in the righteousness of Jesus Christ to forgive your sins to make you right with God? that his death and burial and resurrection because of who he is God Almighty is what guarantees you that you are accepted by God now and forever is that what where your faith lies and beyond that are you trusting in him to do righteously now to live righteously now to be a follower of Christ now it's important that we understand um, what Jesus is saying here because he made a big point of it throughout his time on earth. Um, I'm going to read to you from Mark chapter 2. Just listen as I do. As Jesus passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened as he was dying, dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples. There were many and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees it's our group of um, self-righteous folks again saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners they said to his disciples how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it he said to them those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. <clears throat> In the New Living Translation, it translates that verse this way. When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call sinners, not those who think they are already good enough. And this is the question that it raises for us and that Jesus raises for all of us. Do you think that you're good enough already? Do you think that you're good enough already? And is that what you're trusting in? Do you think that you're good enough for heaven based upon who you are and what you've done? Do you think that you're good enough so that you need no more transformation by Christ to be like Christ. And if so, um, then it's a good thing that you're hearing this this morning because Jesus has a word for you. And that word is that He is wanting to help you recognize your self-righteousness. He wants to help you ascend to that point of seeing yourself as He does and seeing where you are depending upon how well you think of yourself, how, how good you think you are. And to help you see yourself as He does, which is someone who is in incredible need of His help 
and his righteousness. My dad used to have this funny plaque on his wall um, with this goofy little kind of cartoon character posing on it and it said, it's hard to be humble when you're as good as I am. It's hard to be humble when you're as good as I am. And I think sometimes it's hard for us to be humble because we think that we're so good. We go to church, we, um, we're kind to our neighbors, we, take, we, you know, we give to God, we follow God, we read our Bibles, we pray. Um, can't possibly anything be anything wrong in us or with us that, that God wants to change. But friends, there is. And God wants you to recognize that and he wants you to depend on him for that. To open up your hearts and lives to him for that. And in doing so, know that you're going to be blessed to understand that you are not accepted by God because of your own righteousness. You are not accepted by God because of your own righteousness. Well, um, see why you are in, in, in just a little bit. But um, let's go back to our questions. So we know, it's, is, is it the righteous who are accepted by God? Probably not is the answer to that one. I'm not saying absolutely not because um, we uh, don't, don't know uh, everyone's heart just by um, looking at them because we are human. Second question is this, is it the rejects? Is it the rejects, man? I hope so. Because you're looking at one. Um, and let's see what Jesus has to say about them. Verse 21 says, So that servant came and reported these things to his master. And the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. Now, this is the same phrase that Jesus had used in the parable he told before this. Apparently, he really wants them to hear this message about the poor and the, and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And that they are those that he wants to be sought out. We're going to talk about that more in different um, contexts over the next couple of weeks. But this morning, I want you to understand what Jesus is getting at here. There was a belief amongst those um, in the in certain religious circles then that um, said that if you were poor um, or maimed or lamed or blind or those things, then you were in fact thus, thusly so because you had been judged by God uh, for your unfaithfulness because you weren't as good, you weren't as right as, as the other people. Um, so they were the, the, uh, to make a, a long explanation as short as I can there was a group of people who um, lived in the wilderness a group of Jews lived in the wilderness and they, they took um, God's word and manipulated it such to make it even um, to make it extremely strict and burdensome and basically they took the the promises of Deuteronomy that were given to God to the nation of Israel, that where God told them, if, if you uh, if you follow me and keep my commandments, you will be blessed, um, and, and the opposite if you don't. Um, and they took those and they started um, proclaiming proclaiming um, people as blessed or cursed um, um, in their own minds, and that. They manipulated the scripture to judge people. If that makes sense. I know you can't imagine anybody ever doing such a thing, but but it, it happens. It, ha it does happen. They manipulated the scriptures to judge people, and so they would take people um, that they saw, and they would say, "Are you poor?" And they might say, "Yes, I am poor. Can you help me?" And they say, "No, I'm not going to help you." Furthermore, I want you to know that you're poor because God doesn't like you. And someone might be um, maimed, which means that they have been um, injured. And back then, if you broke your hand or broke an arm or broke a leg, they would try to fix it. Um, but it's kind of like me trying to fix it. You know, I'll do my best, 
I'll work my hardest and I'll really do it with care and concern for you, but you're probably still going to be crippled afterwards because they didn't have the um, the medical technology that we and the, the know-how that we do now. So someone could have been injured and then therefore maimed. And then the lame were those who were born with a defect and the blind were those who obviously could not see. And in the book of Leviticus, this is it said that those folks with those specifically with those maladies and those characteristics could not be part of the um, high priesthood in in going into the um, in giving offerings for the people. But they took those things and applied them generally to everybody and said, if you are this way, then it's because God has judged you and therefore you are not acceptable to God. And we think, how horrible, how heartless, how how self-righteous and self-absorbed would you be that could you be to treat people that way? Well, I hate to tell you, but it, it hasn't it hasn't ended, um, and we still, for many years, have mistreated people um, because of what we see as their faults, even their physical ailments, and. Um, Sorry, my computer literally froze up here um, because it's cold too. <laughs> All right, there it goes. So, um, and I'll give you that. Uh, rather than reading the passage in Leviticus, we'll uh, I'll touch on it next week because it'll we'll, we'll need to then as well. But these communities that were super strict had popularized this belief. The Pharisees had adopted because they liked anything they could use to make themselves feel better and to make others look worse. And so um, and I'd like to say that this is all said and done but these ideas um, weren't that way. Um, Such Assumptions and misinterpretations and misapplications um, didn't end after Jesus' parable here, but they continued on in Jewish culture and even showed up in Christianity. And in some ways, they're still alive in what today we still look at people who are a certain way and we we judge them. We we have a certain feeling or thought about them and we um, are in some way um, repulsed by them. I saw a, a meme um, on Facebook this week or last, I can't remember. And it said basically this, that Jesus spent most of his ministry seeking out those that we spend most of our lives seeking to avoid. Jesus spent most of his ministry seeking out those we spend most of our lives seeking to avoid. And I think that's very true because you could fill in the blank here. Maybe you don't look at people who are lame or blind and judge them, but we do with other people. You know, someone, you know, um, smokes or drinks or um, does something that we don't approve of or is maybe is, is poor or less fortunate um, than ourselves. We look at them and say, well, it must be because of um, some wrong that you have done. And... Uh, um, that is unfortunate, and we even do that sometimes when, we, when we, it is about someone's health. This happened in Europe during the Black Plague. They thought that the the um, bubonic plague was God's judgment upon people, and um, really devout, well, really kind of crazy uh, Christians would walk through the streets carrying full-size crosses on their bare backs and whipping themselves till they bled um, and in order to try to um, pay for the penance that they needed to in order to get God's uh, mercy and to him to lift what they saw as a curse upon them. And then after that, what we came to know is what's called the health and wealth gospel that's still prevalent today. 
where people were told if you believe in God, then all your ailments will be cured and your pocketbook will be full. And um, I've known a lot of Christians over my life and they've had plenty of ailments and, and, uh, and plenty of um, um, financial needs. And so that was that's a um, falsehood as well. And I've seen Christians suggest and proclaim that someone is that way impoverished or unhealthy or whatever because they live uh, less godly lives than someone else does. And when we get into that mindset, it gets very dangerous because we start doing the opposite um, of what Jesus was to start doing the exact thing that the Pharisees were doing in their time. We, this idea is destructive and has caused many of us as conservative Christians to misunderstand and to mistreat people. Um, I have seen Christians flaunt what they, what health they have is the result of living a godlier lifestyle than others, and I've seen Christian, Christians quite ungraciously suggest that terribly unfortunate diseases and maladies that plague others are the result of less godlier than my own lifestyles. I have also seen uh, Christians, um, us as Christians, view things like mental illness as simply a faith problem. And all these things points um, to our misunderstanding and sometimes even our arrogance. And we're often like those self-assured Pharisees that Jesus was having supper with, convinced that we are right with God and armed with our trusty means of pointing out those who are not. But because of this parable that we're hearing this morning, there is hope for us and for those who we often pass judgment upon. There's hope for transformation for us and recognizing that it's not our righteousness that makes us acceptable to God. It's hope for us to recognize that there are people that we reject who God does not. There are people that we pass judgment upon that um, for our reasons that, that God is quite willing to accept. Um, we pass judgment upon them based upon our reasoning and God's quite willing to accept them based upon His righteousness. And so we ask the question, is it the righteous that are acceptable to God? Um, probably not if they're righteous in their own sight. Is it the um, rejects, those who we might reject in society? Possibly so. Possibly so is what I want you to think of, how I want you to regard them. Those who you might be tempted to reject or to pass judgment upon, I want you instead to see them as those who are possibilities for God's acceptance through Jesus Christ. And then finally this, the third, third and final question, is it the recipients? Is it the recipients? Jesus came to earth for, uh, to, to save, to seek and to save that which was lost. And he, his word tells us that God so loved the world that he sent Jesus so that those who believe in him will not perish and have everlasting life. And that Jesus was sent into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And in, the, in John chapter 1, I mentioned, as I mentioned to you before, God's word tells us that he came into his own and his own received him not. In other words, he came to the, to the Jewish people and because they, many of them, like the ones he was having dinner with here, thought of themselves as being so righteous that his own received him not. They didn't receive him. Therefore, they were not, could not be accepted by God. But then it goes on to say this, as many as received him to those he gave the right to be called children of God. As many as received him, to those he gave the right to be called children of God. You see, it isn't entirely a matter of being a recipient. 
And what I want you to, to do, how I want you to answer this question, is it the, is it the recipients? Then it's positively yes. Is it the self-righteous? Probably not. Is it the, the, is it the rejects? Possibly so. Is it the recipients? Positively yes. And I want you to make sure this is important of a couple of things. One, that you are in fact a recipient of Jesus Christ. That you understand that his, his coming from heaven, his living on earth, his dying for your sins and rising from the grave was to forgive you and make you acceptable to God. That you have received that truth into your heart and believe it um, unto salvation. And that's what makes you acceptable to God. Secondly, I want you to consider, are you living out that gospel in such a way that you are dependent upon the righteousness of Christ, not upon your own, that you are looking for those who are off, who are seen as uh, who and who you might have once saw and might be struggling with now, seen as rejects, and are you? open to doing whatever is necessary to give them the opportunity to be the recipients of God's grace that they may be accepted by God. We're going to be giving opportunity to do such things. We're going to be taking opportunity to do such thing, things as a church this year. We're going to continue to do such things as a church this year. But it has to start in your heart well, do you say, I recognize that I am self-righteous at times and it's not good and it is not, it is not acceptable to God and does not make me acceptable to God. I recognize that I reject people based upon certain things about them and their lives. I recognize that I in fact, I'm a recipient of grace and want to bless others with, with that same opportunity to be so as well. Will you make that your prayer and desire and ask God to make that your intention this year? Will you depend upon Him to help you be who, you, who He wants you to be and lead others to who he wants them to be, whoever they are, wherever they are, and whatever it takes for you to do so. Let me pray for you and ask God to help us with that this morning. God, we love you and we thank you. And we pray that you would help us this morning to recognize that we are accepted by you because of who you are and what you've done. And I pray that you would help us to realize that and remember that and to grow in that truth. And that our intention would be that in our and that our desire would be because of you that we would be less self righteous and more you righteous. That we would be less rejecting and more seeking those who are rejected and that we would be more grateful thankful rejoicing recipients of your grace and offering that to those who are in great need of it. we ask for that in Jesus name and for your glory Amen